Hi everybody and welcome to Bowtie Teacher. In this video I'm going to be giving you my predictions for the Paper 2H Edexcel GCSE Math content. I've analysed all of the questions from all of the papers in the new specification and I've put together the list of the top 10 things that I think you should study so that you have the best chance of success in the exam. So without further ado, let's take a look. So this diagram that you see in front of you is an overview of all of the topics and all of the marks available. So if you start from the top left, you'll see that we have basic probability, which is worth about 30 of the marks across all of the papers for paper 2H. That means that if you can try to make sure that you study that topic the most, that it will give you the best chance because that is worth a huge chunk of the exam. If you work your way downwards, and to the right, you'll see that we have ratios, equation of a straight line, sketching graphs, etc. And this overview will be able to sort of show you how you should study for this exam, because you should try to make sure that you cover the bases as best as you can by doing everything, but focusing your attention more on those topics that are much more common. So what I'll do in this video is take you through the top things that you need to cover with some examples and how I would answer those questions in the exam, how I can use the calculator as best to my advantage to make sure I'm checking these answers and getting the most marks available as possible. Okay, so we'll start with basic probability and work through this list. But if you want to pause the video and take a screenshot or take a photo of these, you can and just make sure that you try to cover as much of those between now and the summer. So basic probability is the first topic that we're going to talk about and it links to so many different aspects of the GCSE. It crops up so many times and we're just going to try and go through some of the different ways in which this question can be asked and how we answer these. So towards the beginning of papers you'll often see a question that's got um, some Venn diagrams in. So we have our Venn diagrams and all of the different elements within those. So let's say we've got um, probability of having French, German and Spanish and all of these are filled out so let's say we've got these values in here and it would say well what's the probability of someone doing French and German so probability of French and German so probability is cropping up here we want to know the people that do French and German so that would be 7 plus 2 because that is the intersection of French and German and then we would add up the total number of students that take those exams and that might be in a box as well with some students that don't choose any of those so we would make sure that we add those in. We also would see probability cropping up in say a cumulative frequency and it says what's the probability that they are waiting longer than 25 minutes in a doctor's surgery or something like that and you would use your cumulative frequency total let's say that was 60 and this one was 90 then you would work out the number of um, people between 60 and 90 so that would say 30 out of 90 so that would be a third of those people okay we also have the, the kind of standard questions where you have your probability trees and you have to fill those in and we might have something like late late and the probability of that is 0 0.1 and 0 0.1 so what's the probability that they're going to be late on both days so we would multiply those branches as we go down 0 0.1 times 0 0.1 like that okay we've got to make sure as well that we can interpret this data because they'll often ask you questions like what assumptions have you made or what can you say about this information using the probability so we're assuming that it's the same each day and things like that you have to be aware of the conditions and the assumptions that we can make when we interpret this data. Other ones for basic probability are where you have the box and it has like red, yellow, green, and blue counters and it has uh, different values for here 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 and it's got something missing there. So you know that these add up to 1 and then it says well, right, well if there are 120 uh, throws or 120 counters how many of them will be blue so you would work out this missing 0 0.4 and then do 0 0.4 times 120 to work out the number of blue counters in the bag okay so try to look through some of the past papers and 
If you want to refer to my document, I'll try to put a link in the, in the description below so you can see that. And it breaks it down for you so that if you are looking at probability, then down the right hand side you can see it has June 27, 2H, question number one. There's three marks there. In June 2018 is question number eight. So you can go straight to those questions and make sure you can practice those like that. The next concept that comes up very, very often is ratios. And the thing about ratios is that it could go under the radar and you maybe don't realize that they're there. Ratios crop up all over the place. So in paper two, we're looking at the kind of things where we have the stamps that are owned by two people, or they have an example where people are choosing curry and lasagna and things like that. So with the ratios, you try to make them match each other, or you try to find the simplest ratio, okay? We're looking at something like dividing an amount, so say they have 600 pounds and we divide it in the ratio of two to three to four. Okay, we would do something like that. We could try to divide the total of these into the original amount, so you can work out the value of one share. And then once you know what one share is worth, you multiply it by two, then three, then four. Or they might have the first person has half the amount of the second person, things like that. You have to just use a bit of logic and problem solving there to try and work out what each share is worth. We also have the questions where you have like a recipe and you're saying like uh, 600 grams of flour and that is say 12 biscuits. And you have to use ratios to try and work out what one biscuit is worth. You're kind of dividing that, but that's the whole point, is that ratios are to do with dividing. They're linked very closely to fractions. We also have ratios cropping up in uh, vectors. So at a higher level, we have a line, and it's divided in the ratio of 2 to 3. So we add up those two ratios and get 5. So we're doing 2 fifths to 3 fifths but we're also doing um, the ratio of two vectors. So if we have like A and B, and we have 2A and 2B, something like that, how do you prove that those two vectors are parallel to each other? Well, we actually divide the A and 2A, and if they're parallel, that will be the same as the ratio of B to 2B. So we can cancel these like this and you can see that the ratio is a half. So we know that they're in the same ratio and they're in a parallel form. We can also take the two out as a factor and do two A plus B, so we have that same ratio of A's to B's as the original. Other places we might see ratios when we're doing similar shapes like this, and they have six and nine for the length. So we do the length of these two together and we try to cancel this down. So the length scale factor is 2 to 3, and then the area scale, scale factor is the length squared. So we would have 4 to 9. And then the volume would be the length cubed, so we would have 8 to 27. So we can use ratios to answer these questions as well. If you refer back to the original document, you can see just where these ratio questions are cropping up because students don't necessarily realize that you can use ratios to help you answer some of the more difficult questions as well. The next topic that's very, very likely to come up in the paper too is equation of a straight line. So in this case, we need to get our equation in the form of y equals mx plus c. So if we have something like 2y equals 6x, plus 5, we need to divide that by 2 and get 3x plus 2.5, like that. That will give us the m, which is the gradient, the coefficient or the number in front of the x, and the plus c, the plus 2.5 in this case, will be the y-intercept. So we are able to draw a sketch of this line. It goes through 2.5 and has quite a steep gradient of 3. If you want to work out where the x-intercept is, we put y equals to 0 and we solve 0 equals 3x plus 2.5. So we rearrange this to get minus 2.5 over 3 is equal to x. Okay, so that, that point there is the x-intercept. We always just put y equals to 0 in order to find that. If you have um, two points, say a, which is 
1 comma 2 and b which is 5 comma 8 then you would need to find the gradient between those two points so we can use the formula m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 it doesn't matter which way around you do this as long as you're consistent so we're going to make y2 8 and y1 2 we're going to divide that by x2 which is 5 and subtract x1 like that so we get a gradient of 6 over 4 which is the same as 3 over 2 so we now know the gradient between these two points 1 comma 2 and 5 comma 8 that gradient there is 1.5 or 3 over 2 and if you wanted to work out the equation of this line then we would substitute these values back into y equals mx plus c so we know the gradient is 1.5 and we know that y is you can either use 2 and 1 for your x and y coordinates or you can use 5 and 8 whichever you choose will work so I'm going to use 2 for y x will be 1 and then I can rearrange to find my c value so 2 minus 1.5 is 0 0.5 so now I have my m and my c I rewrite rewrite this equation as 1.5 x plus 0 0.5 and the, cal uh, the question sometimes asks you for integers for all of these. So if I double everything, I get 2y equals 3x plus 1, like that. Linked to this nearly every single time is perpendicular gradients. So in order to work out the perpendicular gradient of a line, so let's say our original line was, was here, then our perpendicular line would be coming down at right angles like this. Now we don't know whether it's here or here or here unless we have another point that that's kind of anchored to. But for now let's just work out this perpendicular gradient. What you do is you take your two gradients and multiply them together to give negative 1. So in this case if I'm trying to find the second gradient I use my first gradient which is 3 over 2 times the gradient that I'm trying to find and that's equal to negative 1. So when I divide this I get negative 2 over 3 or the negative reciprocal of the original gradient so we just take that fraction flip it upside down and if it's a positive we make it a minus and if it's a minus we make it plus so now I know that the gradient of my perpendicular line y equals minus 2 thirds x plus c so I don't know where the y-intercept is of these lines unless I have a point that that goes through so let's say it went through the midpoint of those two values or they say it goes through a point P which is 4 comma 6 or something like that then we can substitute these in to this and work out what the new C value is okay we sometimes have midpoints as well linked to this midpoints so let's try and find the midpoint of A and B all we do is we actually average the x and the y coordinates so I'm going to take the x coordinate from a which is 1 and I'm going to add it to the x coordinate of b and half it because taking the average of the two and then I'm going to do 2 plus 8 over 2 which is the average of the two y coordinates so that gives me 1 plus 5 over 2 is 3 comma 5 so that is the exact halfway point between A and B and questions often link the, the midpoint to doing perpendiculars and things like that. So when you're looking at equation of a straight line we're just trying to remember this y equals mx plus c and using the information we have in the question to find the gradient and the y-intercept and go from there that will get you most of the marks for equations of a straight line. Sketching graphs is a skill that is very highly regarded by Edexcel and that comes up a lot out of these questions so at its most basic level we have like a table of values and we can actually use our calculators to help us with these if we're unsure because sometimes students tend to make a mistake when we have the negatives like negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2 and let's say our graph is y equals 3x plus 4 okay we can use the table function on our calculators menu go down to table and our function is 3x plus 4 press equals we don't need a second function so we're just going to do the one function and it's asking for our starting x value which in this case is negative 2 the end value is 
positive 2, we're going up to 2, and we're stepping up in 1s because we're going negative 2, negative 1, 0, etc. So when we do that, we get our x values and our f of x, which is our y coordinates. So I know that these are going to be negative 2, 1, 4, 7, and if I scroll down a bit, I'll see the next one, which is 2, 10. So you can double check your answers when you're doing your tables of values to help you with your plotting. We need to make sure that these points are accurate and that we get our straight line which goes through 0, 0,4 like that. Also, when we're sketching graphs, a lot of the time we have to uh, sketch quadratics. And we've seen some questions in the, in the past papers where they're trying to connect a quadratic with straight lines like this and it's asking you what's wrong with this plot or it's just asking you to fill in some gaps so it might have the table of values and there's lots of these to fill in and you have to fill in the gaps so we can do a table of values let's say we have a function y equals x squared plus 3x plus 1 and we can fill in our function here x squared plus 3x plus 1 and we'll go from negative 2 to 2 again so we get negative 2 0 1 2 and we get negative 1 negative 1 1 5 and 11 okay this is really useful as, as you get later on into the exam as well if you wanted to do a function such as 2 cos 2x plus 3 it can be as complicated as that as well we can use this from say 0 to 360 and go up in steps of 30 so that's really handy if you're trying to um, plot your graph or see if your graph transformation is correct you can use these table of values to help you out okay so when you're plotting your quadratics make sure that there, there's a smooth curve there and that the turning point and everything like that is correct. We also have cumulative frequency graphs. We have to make sure that we're plotting the end point of the class. So let's say we have heights or something like that. We have 0 less than or equal to h less than 10, 10 to 30. You must make sure you plot the end point of the class. Don't do the midpoint or anything like that. And we use the graph to do that, estimations of things like that, the median interquartile range. So we need to make sure that our sketch is accurate so that we can make those uh, estimations to a, a suitable degree of accuracy. Sometimes we get um, a cubic graph, which we know kind of looks like this. Again, you can use your tables of values just to check. And on those occasions where they have a straight line that intersects or it does something like this and we have a new equation to solve then make sure you're using the cubic function on your calculator as well which is under equation polynomial of degree 3 so you can type in the cubics there get your three intersects or maybe two or, or one depending on, on what the graph is and you can check the accuracy of your sketches there as well make sure that the solutions are correct Another time where you might use your graph to help you is when you're doing your iterations or you're showing the roots of an equation when it changes from positive to negative. You can use your table of values to really zoom in between, say, 1 and 2 and go up in steps of 0 0.1. You'll see that change of sign there as well, and that will help you to see if you've got your iterations correct. So for compound interest, we're looking at, say, £10,000 invested at 3% per annum and we do that for four years. So there's a couple of ways of doing this. We can use the calculator again, or we can use the formula of 10,000. We multiply by one plus, because in this case, the interest is going up. If it was a depreciation, we would do a minus here. We do our three over 100 for our percentage, and we raise it to the power of the number of years, which in this case is four. So we can go and do 10,000 times 1 plus 3 over 100 and raise that to the power of 4. So that will give us our compound interest straight away. Sometimes they ask you for what is the interest or they'll ask you to round it. So 
So make sure that you're reading the question carefully and, and you don't just put 11,255 if they ask you just for the interest. You have to subtract your original amount. Sometimes they combine this question with um, 10,000 times 1 plus the percentage we don't actually know. And we know that we've raised it to a power of, say, 4, and that's equal to a certain amount. So let's say, in this case, let's say it's 11, 11, 2, 5, 5, and we want to find out what x is. So we have to know this formula first of all, and then we have to be able to rearrange this. So we're going to divide both sides by 10,000 like this, and then we're going to take the fourth root of this, so that we're left with 1 plus x over 100 is equal to that horrible decimal there. So let's do 11, 2, 5, 5 over 1,000, 10,000, sorry. And then we take the fourth root of the answer. So we're going to do shift here, fourth root of the answer. We get 1.02. So let's do 1.0299 like that. And then we're going to rearrange this so we get x over 100 is equal to that minus 1. So we're going to minus 1. And then we're going to times that by 100 to get our x value. So 2.999 there. So we, uh, we rounded it so it doesn't give us exactly 3. So that's 0 0.0299. And so x is equal to 2.99%. Okay. So when you're doing this, you need to be able to reverse the process as well, taking the fourth root because it's four years. If it was three years, we take the cube root, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure you're comfortable with that and maybe breaking it down as well. So there's questions where they do that for two years and then they want to know, well, what was the percentage for the third year? So you just do the exact same process. So algebraic fractions is a topic that causes students a lot of problems because we have something like 1 over x plus 1 and we have to add that to 2 over x plus 3, and they get kind of confused as to how to do this. So the easiest way to do this is to actually try to cross multiply these like this. So we're going to do 1 brackets x plus 3, and then we have a plus 2 lots of x plus 1. So we've cross multiplied these, and then we multiply the denominators to get a single one like this on the bottom. So now that we've done that, we can actually expand the numerator like that over x plus 1, x plus 3, and then do a little tidy up here. We've got 3x plus 5 over x plus 1, x plus 3 like that. Okay, so if you're adding and subtracting fractions, this is how you do it, just like if you had 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4, you would cross multiply these to get 4 plus 3 over, and then you times the two denominators like that. Other examples that you have to be able to deal with is having something like 4x squared minus 25 over 2x squared plus 9x plus 10. So in this case, we're using a combination of difference of two squares and factorizing. So we need to be able to recognize that this is the same as 2x squared minus 5 squared all over. And then we factorize this to get 2x plus 5 and x plus 2. I think that will work. Yeah. So in the numerator, we have the 2x plus 5 and the 2x minus 5, like that. And that gives us a hint as well to what the denominator in this case is going to be, because if you've got 2x plus 5 or 2x minus 5 in the numerator, you're probably going to have that in the denominator as well. So that gives us an, a help as to what one of the brackets is going to be. Now that we've got two the same, we can cancel these, and we're left with 2x minus 5 over x plus 2. If I had something like 1 plus x plus 1 over x plus 2, and I'm trying to add that to get a 1 fraction, then I need to change that 1 so that it has a common denominator. So I'm going to multiply it by x plus 2 over x plus 2. So I'm multiplying it by uh, x plus 2 over x plus 2. That's the same as multiplying it by 1, so that's not a problem. And then we still have our x plus 1 over x plus 2. 
and now we have the same denominator we can add them together so we've got x plus 2 from the left hand side plus x plus 1 all over x plus 2 okay students try to cancel things and do strange things like that which you're not allowed to do you have to collect these together in the right way so 2x plus 3 over x plus 2 so let's use this knowledge to help us to solve some basic algebraic fraction equations so something like 3 over x plus 1 is equal to 8 over 12 okay so what we would do is we try to cross multiply these to get rid of the denominators so we can do 12 times 3 is equal to 8 brackets x plus 1 and then we can multiply this out to get our answer so 36 minus 8 is equal to 8x x equals 28 over 8 x equals divide that by 2 and we get 14 over 4 which equals 7 over 2 we can check that with the calculator using the solve function so let's have a look at 3 over x plus 1 and then we're going to use the alpha equals button to get this uh, red equals here alpha equals is just that button there and we're going to do 8 over 12 and then we press the shift solve button and when we do that we're, we're pre presented with a, a black bar here which is just a value to start this process off so the calculator is going to iterate through some answers and see if it can get one we can put any value that we want in here I usually just choose a zero and when we press equals a couple of times it will give us our answer of x equals 3.5 so this allows us to check our answer when we are solving any equation that we like we can do more complicated ones than that on the calculator as well as long as there's no squares or cubes it will only give us one of the answers but um, yeah if you've got a linear equation like that you can solve it using the solve button speed distance time questions are very very common in the GCSE so not only do you have to be able to understand the different graphs and what they mean so displacement and time and the velocity and time and what each of those represent but you also be, have to be able to work out the area underneath these graphs in terms of a VT graph or a speed time graph so that you can estimate the distance traveled okay we might have a question where a plane is traveling you know 750 miles and it takes two hours and 36 minutes okay so the first thing we need to be able to do is to convert this two hours 36 minutes into a decimal so with our calculator we can do the two and then we can use the time button here two hours 36 minutes and press equals and SD so that's 2.6 hours so we can use that button there to convert that into a decimal of 2.6 hours and then we can use our speed equals distance divided by time to get 750 miles over 2.6 don't make the mistake of doing 2.36 because that's not um, the decimal for this it's 2.6 hours so that's the first thing you might have to convert something like uh, 36 kilometers per hour into meters per second okay so you need to be able to do 36 kilometers is 36,000 meters and divide by 3,600 you can also use um, 36 and if you use the shift and number 8 for the conversion button and go down to velocity there's an option there for kilometers per hour into meters per second so you can also check that you get the correct answer of 10 there so the shift conversion button is quite useful there when we're looking at these curves for a velocity time graph and we get something like this and it says to estimate the distance traveled by this object we split this graph into strips so we might split that into three or four equal strips like this and each of these we can approximate with a trapezium here so I'm just connecting those with a straight line like this and you can work out the 
an estimate for the area under that graph by using your area of a trapezium, which is a half, the two parallel sides, which in this case would be the two velocities here, and multiply by h. So you have to imagine this trapezium is on its side and the h is actually the width of that bar. So if we had an example here, and this was, we read this, this off, and this is 2, and this goes up to 6, and every 2 seconds, so 2, 4, 6, 8, something like that, then that second bar here, that second trapezium, would be half 2 plus 6, and multiplied by the distance between the time intervals, which is 2. Okay, So we have 8 meters traveled between two and four seconds. If you did this for all of these um, trapezia here, it will often ask you, is this an overestimate or an underestimate? So you have to decide on whether the graph is kind of like a, 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 a curve going up like this or if it's a curve kind of going like that. Because when you do your trapezia, you can see that you're missing out some of the distance here when the curve is going that direction. But when it's going upwards like this, and you do your trapezia, you're actually adding a bit every time like that. So the distance that you're creating when you do these estimates might be an overestimate if you're adding a little bit extra on top of those bars, or an underestimate if you're missing a little bit out underneath there. Okay. So make sure you can interpret these velocity time graphs. You know, is that a constant speed or is it stationary? Depending on whether this is a dt graph or a vt graph. And when you take the gradient, there's a link there for differentiation. So when you differentiate the distance or the displacement, you get the velocity because that the gradient there is the velocity. And if you have a vt graph, the change in velocity over time is the acceleration. So when you differentiate the velocity, you get the acceleration. So that's the link between those there. Estimating from a graph is a common concept that Edexcel want you to be able to do, and it crops up all the time. We have things like this, where we have a cumulative frequency, and we have to estimate using our ruler and making sure that we are accurate with our graphs. So this might be the median, or we might have the interquartile ranges going from here and here. We have to be able to estimate from the graph in a cumulative frequency to find out the median or, or maybe even a specific point like that might be 72 minutes waiting in a doctor's surgery or something like that so you have to read off and estimate from the graph we're also doing a lot of estimating when we have our solutions like this so let's say a solution crosses the axis at this point here we're estimating the solution of an equation so if this is the x and y axis and this is our function, then the solution is where this graph crosses the x-axis. So we have to be able to estimate that point to a degree, you know, maybe one decimal place or something like that. You might have a graph that intersects. We talked about that a bit more earlier in the video. But let's say we have a graph that does this. And we have to estimate this. We have to read these coordinates off and make sure that we're looking at solutions of the two intersections here. So simultaneous equations, but between a cubic and a straight line or something like that. Other times, we might have a scatter graph, and we have to put in a kind of line of best fit through these so that we can estimate you know, an unknown value just like you do in science. All right, so you should be pretty used to doing that. But you're estimating from a graph again in that type of question. Another example is when you have a function that's a curve, it might look something like that as well, f of x, and it asks you for an estimate of, say, the, the velocity, if this is a dt graph, or it might be just a velocity and it's asking you for the acceleration, or it might even ask you what's an estimate for the gradient at that particular point. So if that's the point that you're looking at, we try and draw a tangent to this, and then we're going to estimate the gradient. So we're going to do our triangle and try and work out the gradient. So the change in y divided by the change in x or rise over run, whatever you want to call that. We're estimating that from the graph. We might also have some sort of trig function and it's kind of doing this. 
and we want to might estimate a solution which is kind of going through like that so again where these cross this would be the estimate of a solution like that so it, it appears a lot have a look at this diagram here so you can estimate from the graph you can see the sorts of questions where that that crops up so June 27 take a look at that make sure you're estimating you could do it with a box plot in, a, in in some cases as well you're looking at the estimate for a median or something like that it's kind of linked in there the next topic I want to talk about is bounds so this is a, a topic that students kind of find difficult once you get the hang of it it's actually not too bad so the first instance you might have something like 3.7 and that's a length say in centimeters measured to the nearest one decimal place so what's the range of values that that can be or the error interval as they they call it um, earlier on in the test this is the same concept so one decimal place what you do is you take your accuracy and you divide it by two so one decimal place in this case would be 0.1 so we're going to half that and go 0 0.05 we're going to add 0 0.05 in that direction and minus 0 0.05 in this direction to get 3.65 and 3.75 at the upper end now we can't actually have 3.75 because that would round up so we do the less than sign here but we do the less than or equal to sign here because we're allowed to have 3.65 if we were then to do another one like 12 and we do that to the nearest integer for example so the nearest integer would be the nearest one so we halve that to get the nearest 0.5 so this one would go down by uh, 0 0.5 to get 11.5 and we can go up to 12.5 and we do the less than less than or equal to like that once we have that information it might be for example we have um, a, a rectangle and we have 3.7 and 12 obviously not to scale so we would say well what's the what's the greatest possible area we can have so if we want the biggest area we're going to take the biggest possible value for each of these because we're multiplying them together so we would take the 12.5 and the 3.75 and we would multiply those together in order to get the largest possible area so when we're multiplying and we want the largest we multiply the two biggest bounds if we were do, doing some sort of division however we might have c equals e over f let's say we've got e is equal to 1.5 to the nearest 1 dp and f is equal to 3 to the nearest integer so pause the video and see if you can work out the two bounds the two extremes of these so 1.5 to the upper bound would be 1.55 because the one decimal place would give you 0 0.1 we half that to give 0 0.05 so we go up to 1.55 and down to 1.45 and then the nearest integer we would half that to give you plus 0.5 to 3.5 and minus 0.5 to give you 2.5 now when we're dividing it's it's a little bit more tricky than when we're multiplying if we want the upper bound of c that means when we're dividing we want the largest possible numerator and the smallest possible denominator so that when we're doing the division we have the biggest possible thing we can have and we're dividing it by the smallest that we can have you can try and link this to say a pizza and you have more people then you're dividing it by more people you're getting smaller amounts overall so we would take the largest possible e of 1.55 and divide that by the smallest f 2.5 conversely if we wanted the smallest possible c we would take the smallest numerator and divide it by the biggest denominator so if we wanted the smallest amount of pizza we would have the smallest amount of pizza divided by the most amount of people in this case that would be 1.45 over 3.5 and you can see you're dividing a smaller number by a bigger number you're going to have a smaller value overall once you understand this concept most of these bound questions tend to become a lot easier even if you have something like c equals e over a plus b okay so in this case if you wanted the largest possible c 
you would take the largest E and because you're adding A and B and you want the smallest denominator, you would take the smallest A plus the smallest B. For rounding, there isn't much to say about this. I'm sure that you can all round really, really well. But the reason why it's so important to mention this is because students often forget to look back at the question and check to see the degree of accuracy that the question actually requires. So when you're doing your past papers, try to make a concerted effort to keep looking back, keep looking back every question to make sure that you're rounding to 1DP, 3SF, or whatever accuracy they are asking for, because you'd be surprised at how many marks are actually lost from rounding errors or neglecting to round correctly. Okay, so that's quite an easy one. Just make sure you round properly at every possible opportunity. Okay, so that was a quite a quick whistle-stop tour through some of the more common questions that you're going to come up against in the paper 2H. Obviously, there's much, much more to that, and you should try to make sure that you go through as many of those topics as possible. Going back through all of the questions, trying to make sure that you cover everything, so you're going from the top left to the bottom right and working your way down, as opposed to just trying to go through a textbook and answer all the questions that you can. You should try and be a bit more strategic with your revision and try to cover those things that are going to come up the most and making sure that you're not dropping easy mistakes, easy marks uh, as you go through. Making sure you cover those things, you get them right and then you're well on the way to getting that grade 9 or 8 or whatever it is that you're trying to push for. Okay. So if you have any questions or you would like me to follow up with some more topics or perhaps I'll try to do a paper that has these things contained within it. Just let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, I wish you all the very best in your exam in the summer.